Okay, we're going to try this again, y'all. Hello, 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 hello. I am going ahead now and getting, there we go, here we go. But here we go. I just sent the invite. And hello, loyals. Hello, loyals. Hi, how are you? Hey, how you doing? I am so excited you- for this interview, and I do thank you for taking the time out. No problem. Now, first and foremost, I would like to thank your brother, Father MC, for connecting us and linking this, for letting this meeting happen. So I appreciate okay. him, okay. and thank you, Father MC, because I had him on a few weeks ago, and he's just funny and <laughs> hilarious. <Yeah. laughs> So first and foremost, how did your um your premiere go? Didn't you have um something just a few minutes ago? No, actually, uh, we may not have a uh, a traditional premiere because of COVID. Um, mm-hmm. The show is on Sunday. At, the show is Sunday, April eighteenth. So um, we're still trying to uh, figure certain things out because of COVID. Everything may have to be virtual. Okay, I do understand that. And yes, that's why I was trying to get you on before season two, because I already have it in my phone. I'm, I post it as much as possible because I love the storyline. And I, I don't know if people, you want to say I'm a mobster. His, I love the research on them, like Al Capone, things to that nature. But when I seen you did this one, I was like, oh, yes. Now we're hearing from the African American aspect of, and on top of that, showing a different side as well. Yep. So I love it. I love it. It's not just about the gangster, but just showing him as a person. You're showing what now, he did yeah. for the community. Actually, the, the the log line for the project is like when we were selling it. It's the collision of civil rights and the underworld. So it's not just a mob story, but it's a mob story with the relationship with civil rights and things of that sort. So, um, you know, it's not your, your good fellas. It's not your, uh, your mobsters or your, you know, your traditional mob uh, narratives. It's really about the relationship between a mobster who was Bumpy Johnson and, uh, and uh, the Italians and civil rights leaders. And I love it. I love it. So, for the ones that may not know you, introduce yourself, King. Um, my name is Marquan Smith. Uh, I'm an actor, executive producer, uh, one of the initiators and creators behind The Godfather of Harlem. It took a team of us to get this done. But the story comes from me being the heartbeat of uh, my godmother's Margaret Johnson, who was uh, living in Lenox Terrace at the time who passed away December 16, 2016. And, um, yeah, that's me in a whole. I started off in the music industry, uh, traveling with my older brother, Father MC. And um, I think our first tour was Candyman, Troop, High Five, Second and None, AMG, DJ Quick. You know, he was responsible of taking me around the world and showing me uh, a different light. You know, coming from Harlem to um, Far Rockaway, Queens was really a big transition and that was one of the transitions of being in far rockaway it's not really too much things for someone at my age to do so um father you know took me on tour with him now i do understand and that's great now him being the big brother and seeing that he needs to keep you under his wing and everything with the um situation occurring for him to do that for you regarding um the juvenile system things to that yeah, I, nature I was, I was basically you know to be honest with you i was getting in a lot of trouble running through you know being in dfy you know hopping in and out of spafford lincoln hall beach house all, all the things that inner city kids go through and they may have to graduate from there and then you Go to Rikers Island. From Rikers Island, you go upstate. You know, there was a book that I read called Man, Child, and the Promised Land by uh, Claude Brown. 
And uh, in order to read, in order for you to get a furlough or even come home on a visit, you would, my counselor had me read that book. And um, I always knew, you know, my brother was always, you know, he was working at Kentucky Fried Chicken at the time, you know. And um, they called him the chicken man. <laughs> but he, he, was, he was the fly chicken guy. He would come out with flour all over his clothes. But, you know, after he punched out and he showered up, he had silk shirts and he had ballets on. And, you know, his dream was to become a rapper. And that's what it, we you know, that's what, exactly what he did. And, you know, just following his lead and him just, you know, believing in his dream. You know, I remember just taking the A train and drinking 40 ounces two, three in the morning, coming back to Far Rockaway, which is the last stop on the A, eating that uh, Chinese rice with the red sauce, with the red cups. You know, it was it was just a, an experience. And I just knew that um, the way that I was was going was not the, the, the only way. Yes. And that's a beautiful thing because I'm from Long Island, Huntington. So oh. I know about those r train rides. And now my mother lives in Shirley. So, you know, that's a longer train ride. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so some people in the chat saying, congratulations, my brother. Go, Mark. Congratulations, Mark. Let's go, Mark. That's Ron. Thank he's one of, he's the CEO. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, we see the interviews, but tell us some fun facts about you. Tell us you. Well, if anybody really knows me, like, people know me as Marquand, but if you really know me, then you know me as Silk. That's my nickname. I got that growing up. Um, also, you know, I'm, I'm a sneakerhead. I love sneakers. I love clothes. I love, I love fashion. I've always been that type of uh, person. You know, I love music as well. Um, I'm real big about creating, and uh, I, I love to read as well, too. Okay. So, yeah, so let's ask, what type of books, and besides fiction and things of that nature, what grabs you? Well, I like true stories. I like uh, reading about uh, narratives of people, what they go through, you know, like real things that could affect you. You know, uh, like I said, you know, like the man, child, and the promised land. I love that, man. That was like something that was really like it. To this day, I love that book. Um, okay. Any any true life story and true life experiences, I really like that. Okay. And then they also like to call you Silk when you're on the stage, the hype man for Father yeah, MC absolutely. and absolutely. Like I said, <laughs> if anybody knows me, anybody that calls me right name by, by Marquand, it's more than likely we just met recently. Like, if you knew me, you knew me as Silk. That was my nickname. Father used to call me that because he said that, um, you know, I was smooth with the girls or whatever like that. And, um, yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a rough time growing up in Far Rockway, but it was also a time to educate yourself and just let yourself know that, you know what, this is not what I want to do. This is not where I want to go. And this is not where I want to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, we have a question in the chat. I love music. Favorite group or singer? And what is the best era of music? You know, the best era of music to me, I think, uh, I really like that. I really like the late 80s, that New Jack Swing, that New Jack Swing era, you know? And I also love the era when people wanted to dance. You know, when you listen to Cheryl Lynn or Gwen Guthrie or, P or Patrice Russian, or uh, Minnie Ripperton. I like. I love. I have an old soul. I love uh, old school music. Oh, I do too. I grew up with my parents playing that Friday and Saturdays family gatherings and the cookouts. I miss all of that. Now yeah. with COVID, everything is so different. It's sad though. Yeah, but the is. stylistics, the whispers, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you know, I, I love the era like. I see one of my friends and I, I'm looking at I'm looking at the people typing like my boy Emo, uh like Ed Morales, like he's one of the dopest dancers I ever seen, man. He used to uh dance with Mariah Carey, a whole bunch of this is like this is like you gotta really know the era of the nineties and the eighties just growing up, like going to clubs and just dancing and just enjoying yourself. It wasn't really no mean mugging or anything like that. That's when music was fun to me, you know what I'm saying? Yes, I agree. And then the house parties when the lights yeah. go out and yeah. what you may pay five dollars to get in the door, but everything else, yeah, I miss that. The red light specials, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yes. I miss it all. Now, how's it going with the city of Oakland? Are you still working on that? Is that coming soon? I'm still, I have a, I have a bunch of projects uh, that I've been developing uh, ever since uh, 2017, 2018. And it's just about right now, I'm looking for a home that I can, a place that I can call home, whether it's a Universal or a Sony or a Warner or a Fox, where I could develop good content and we could tell our stories. So those stories I'm definitely working on and, and definitely uh, attempting to sell. Okay. Have you have you tried to reach out to Tyler Perry? Well, it's see, one thing about me as we are creators is all about creating your own lane and your own narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to do. I respect what Tyler Perry is doing. But the thing is for you to uh I call myself a Kyrie Irving. I'm not trying to be under LeBron James. I'm trying to uh create my own path and create my own lane. You feel what I'm saying? You know, everybody I respect Daniels, that. Lee Daniels has his lane, Will Packer has his lane, Tyler Perry has his lane. Now it's for me to create my own lane. And uh, you know, Godfather Harlem is one of the uh trust me, I just begun. Trust me. Yes. Now it took you from the research eighteen years and then it says I wrote down a year and a half with the script. Yeah, well it was eighteen years in the making because I used to go to Lennox Terrace. And every Sunday, I used to sit down with Margaret Johnson, who's like my godmother. And I used to sit up there, and she would tell me these magical moments about Harlem, how she used to walk outside and smell uh, fresh laundry hanging out a tenement window, or walk past the Apollo and see uh, James Brown's name above a marquee, or even walk past Sugar Ray Robinson's barbershop, and you'll see Nat King Cole getting a shape up. And um, the stories are so magical about Harlem but there was also racism happening in Harlem because it was a bunch of, you know, people migrated from the South and it wasn't the same Bull Connor South and the, the hoses and the dogs, but racism was still happening and it was still prevalent in Harlem at the time. You feel what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, an African-American uh, may want to purchase a hat. He walks into the hat store that's owned by a, 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 a white, uh, a white uh, business owner and he might tell you, well, you got to put the shower cap on your head to try this hat on. Or African-American family couldn't even get a steak dinner because they had white patrons, uh, patrons um, eating in the back and you had to have takeout. So all of these things she used to tell me, and then she also used to tell me about her grandfather. His name was Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, who uh, migrated up here from Charleston, South Carolina. And he was the only individual at that time that was able to sit down with the mob. I'm talking about the real mob, the five families, like, Lucky Luciano, Maya Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Frank Costello, Vito Genovese. You know, these are the guys that started the, 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 the families because you got to understand Bumpy was born in 1905, October 31st, 1905. So that was the time when, you know, uh, un organized crime was happening in the Italian community. But they didn't look at him as being ignorant. They looked at him as they needed him to be the liaison between Pleasant Avenue and West Harlem or, 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 or Harlem period. And the um, story was really interesting. And um, he wasn't just a gangster, but he read Nietzsche. He read Shakespeare. It's even urban legends that he beat Bobby Fischer in chess. So mm. this is, uh, that was one of, the, uh, one of the interesting things that I did like about Bumpy because he wasn't just a gangster. And, you know, his relationship, she used to tell me that Malcolm X used to come up to um, the house every Sunday and have, uh, 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 and play chess or just sit down and have a meal with them, you know? And it was just very interesting. And I, like I said, I made her a promise that um, I would go out there and get this project done, not what you saw in uh, The Cotton Club or Hoodlum or American Gangster, because Bumpy didn't die in front of 20 uh, R RCA TVs in an electronic store. He actually died in my character's arms because he had congestive heart failure. He died at uh, this place called Wells. You know, they mm -hmm. had the best chicken and waffles in Harlem at the time. So I made her a promise that I would go about trying to get it done. And then if anybody knows in Hollywood, it's not easy. You think the music industry is hard. Television is not easy to go in there and um, sell a $100 million project because the first thing they want to know is what is their ROI? You're basically asking me to invest in something. What is the, how are we going to get this money back? So we had our bumps and our bruises, myself and Forrest, 
and uh, Chris uh, Chris Brancato, who's the creator and the writer. But we just uh, we were able to get it done. Done. I got turned down by three networks, and um, one network, Epics, who was ran by Michael Wright, who just came from Steven Spielberg's company, Amblin Entertainment, said, "You know what? I don't want to be coy about this. I I like this project." And he bought it in the room, and that's you know that's how it happened. And um, we're the we're the uh, flagship show of the network. I'm I can say that you know we we have one of the highest ratings that the network ever had. But you're doing it. You're doing big things. Thank and you. one one of your friends says, "But you did it, homie. Good luck." Oh yeah, I mean, people, people. I tell this. I say, don't look at my breakthrough. Look what I've been through. You feel what I'm saying? Amen. People tend as people, and it's it's so funny. I get a lot of DMs and I get a lot of emails about, "Can you put me on? Could you hook me up?" People want a microwave society instead of a marathon. You know, not to sound cliche, it's like what Nipsey said, but you have to look and see what I've been through. Like, I fight for real estate every day on the show. Um, I had to audition for my own character. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, you know, I had to audition. Uh, uh, peace out to my boy, Little Sean. He's in the, and he's in the building. I see him. Um, yeah, man, I, I had to fight for everything. I had to fight for everything from my character to being in a writer's room to... Uh, uh, research. So when people ask me that, I just look at them side eye. I'm like, yo, I'm still fighting every day, and you expect me to just to walk you in and say, you know, it's 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 crazy. Behind the smokes, X. Oh yeah, you gotta says, get. Little, I'm proud gotta, of you. You gotta get little Sean on your platform, man. Little Sean used to write for my brother, and uh, he's one of the prolific um, writers of the of the '90s, and he got a lot of stuff going on as well. With, with oh, little stuff. Sean! Yeah, I you would better love you to have to get him. On, yeah, you need to get him on your platform, definitely. Oh, I'll I'll inbox him if you're down for it, little Sean. I'm I, Sunshine is down for it because one thing I love is history, the good, the bad, the ugly, the sweet, the beautiful. I love history, and I keep telling my children, knowledge is power. You cannot let just the school teach our children anything. You need to teach them to go look and find it themselves. I'm teaching well, I, I, my children I, I, now to be business. I tell people all the time, man, if you knock an opportunity's door and it doesn't open up, go to Home Depot, get some lumber and build your own door and, and create your own doorknob and open it yourself because you, nobody owes you anything. And that's the thing about people. People think that people owe you. People don't, it, they don't give a, a, a damn. At the end of the day, the network cares about sales. They can say, oh, this story was close to your heart. I, I, I love what you're doing, but at the end of the day, it's the ROI, your return on investment. I agree. And I'm happy you're speaking and telling it because being an African-American, trying to be in the cinemas and to be on television, you're telling your story, and I appreciate that. Because no, I was uh, when, I, when, I, when I when I when I first got my deal with ABC, they told me on the Disney lot that for me to be in my show a show, and to executive produce it, I might as well get struck by lightning twice. I mean, I was already written out, but you know when you have people like Chris Brancato and Forrest Whitaker and Jim Atchison and Nina Yang Bon Jovi and Paul Lexstein all by your side, and you know we're just going out like Voltron. It's like failure is not an option. You know, like I tell people this, uh, I I had to make this work. I didn't have a, a, a safety net underneath myself. So if I fall, something would catch me. You know, Forrest can go do, you know, another multi, multi-million dollar movie. Chris could go write another hit TV series. This is all I had. So I had to put more push and inspire everybody to say, don't give up. Let's let's get this going. Amen. Amen. Now. I, I agree. Like, I I send out invites um, to artists. If they respond, they respond. They don't. I was like, okay, another door. God saying it's not time for them yet. But I do. And your brother was funny. He was like, I like that you were persistent. <laughs> well, that's how, what, what, what did your mother say? A closed mouth won't get fed? Yeah. Like, you have to open, you have to go out there and you have to get yours. And you can't expect anybody to give it to you. You have to go out there and create your like if create your own lane. If you're an actor and no one is uh uh casting you, create a project that you could be in. 
and, 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 and prove to people that what you can do. Now, here goes some questions from our viewers and some of my friends. What did you learn from producing the first season that you plan to do different this season? Well, we were forced to do something different this season because of COVID. So um, we had to learn to take what little that was given to us and make it look as big as possible. And I think we did a great job where we were able to make 10 episodes look, 10, look like 10 motion pictures. I can't wait for you guys to see it um, set to, on, uh, on this, this Sunday, April 18th. Oh, I can't wait either. I, oh, I'm excited for it. Now, do you believe after your Harlem project getting turned down for 18 years had anything to do with your race? You know, I wouldn't say. I mean, race did play a, a, a part of when I when the show got picked up, and you know, there's an urban legend that says we don't we don't uh, black people's shows don't do well overseas. You know that that's always been that urban legend, but I never used that as my uh, as, as a crutch. You know, I just looked at, I just kept it moving. I, I I can't even say it was because of that. You know, the show mm -hmm. got picked up. You know, so I can't even say that. But I know, I know the you know corporations get scared. They're like, we're investing all this money, and they go in algorithms, and they go in demographics, and they go in the his historical. Oh, this show didn't sell in this market. But when I told them about the Black Panther, they said it was an anomaly. So I, we had to really discuss. It wasn't about race. It was the content of the project. Because if you look at Godfather Harlem, to be real with you. We have a balance of, uh, 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 of cast. It's diverse. It's not just African-Americans. You got Vincent D'Onofrio, who's playing uh, Vinny the Chin. You got uh, Paul Savino. You have Chaz Palminteri. You got Lucy Fry. You got Rafi Caron. You know what I'm saying? So it's not just an African-American show. It's a good show. Yes, and I love all those actors. And when I just seen the preview for the beginning of... Um, the fellas on the speakeasy was like, Sunshine, you haven't watched it yet? I'm like, I have so many different hats I'm wearing. All right. So I been watched it one weekend and I was hooked. I was like, oh, I got to get him on the show. <laughs> oh, you binge watched it? I been watched it. When I tell you I ordered pizza, when I been watched it. That weekend was silent. I'm watching this. I was taking notes. I love it. One, I learned how to play chess with my sixth grade teacher in elementary school. So now I we taught our boys. So they know how to play chess. My youngest is 10. He learned how to play chess at eight. So we play chess. We play spit. We teach them the dynamics of not just being behind the gaming. No, you're going to learn the streets. You're going to learn chess you're going to learn how to read and dissect things listen to the music but dissect it get it grasp it things to that nature and i try to make them multi diverse and everything I, I i understand what you're saying because a lot of uh people say they want to be directors and producers or actors but you have to study your craft you have to go out there if you got to go to barnes and nobles and get producing for dummies or or writing for dummies or acting for dummies. Learn your craft because when you're put in front of that audience, if you don't know what you're doing, they'll show it, it. It'll show, you know. And it's just not about going in front of a camera and just saying your lines. It's about different angles. If you got a fifty, if you got a fifty lens on you, a sixty-five lens on you, when you have to bring down your character or bring it back up, you know, um, learn the, learn the, the 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 lingo when they're going to do push-ins on you, when they're going to pan out, things of that sort. That really helps you learn your craft and makes people really want to work with you. Now, Trey asks, what was your feeling? Well, that's my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> what was your feeling when you first got the word that it was a done deal? Um, to be honest with you, it was, it was kind of like a sigh of relief because I was at my lowest point. I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to turn back to go to the streets. I didn't know what it was. You know, I was in a place because I worked in corporate America for 16 years. I worked at BET, right? Mm -hmm. And after 16 years, they let me go and they gave me $4,000 of severance for 16 years of work. And 
that's, that's I think I really needed that because that's when I realized who were who were work work friends and who were friends. And you start knowing that you know all you got is God and yourself. So um it was it was a scary moment for me, but when I when I learned that I got the deal, it was the deal is never closed until the signature is there because people pull out of deals all day. So I guess that really affected me when I when I saw those campers and those honey wagons and those cameras and the lights were there. I'm like, okay, we're really in production right now. It's more than just getting a deal. We're in production. You know, we got I'm on I'm on location with the location scouts. Um, I'm in the writer's room. That's when I knew that I was like, okay, we're really doing something right now. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. everybody on here, myself, one of my co um the CEO, he was like, Wow, B E T. Yeah. I when I heard about that story on how B E T treated you, I, that's like a smack in the yeah. face, but like you said, it was a weight eye opener. But you know what? That's just part of part of the chapter of my story. And um, I think any successful person, the story behind them was, it brings the success. Like, I love Samuel Jackson's story about him smoking drugs or doing drugs behind the Apollo. He had a, a substance abuse problem. Look where he's at right now. You look at Charles Dutton, who went from jail to jail, went from being locked up for manslaughter to being, being a self-acclaimed director and actor. You look at... Uh, What's his name? Tim Allen from the Home Improvement Stories. And he was locked up for selling cocaine for two years. You look at our Eric Bishop, whose real name is Jamie Foxx, who came to Hollywood and he was homeless. Sto these type of stories and these type of journeys really motivate you and you appreciate it more. I, I agree. And amen on that one. Now, a uh, person says, where are you at in your life when God shout first to, gave you this vision? Shout out to Jamel, shout out to Jamel Shabazz. Jamel Shabazz actually is the most prolific photographer of our era. He's like our Gordon Parks. You guys must give him his flowers right now. He did the whole campaign for season one. He's on there right now. He has tons of books that you can get, coffee table books that are out of the world. So Jamel Shabazz is somebody else you should get on your platform. Jamel Shabazz is definitely a king of kings. You know, Swiss Beats, Alicia Keys, they all love his. He's done campaigns for everybody, and we were blessed to have him on the first season during the photos. Jamel Shabazz, I would love to speak to you. Can I inbox you after the show? I would love to speak with you and get you on the show. Because one thing about me, I love to give flowers while we are alive. Because when yep. we're gone, nobody sees it. Without his vision and without his vision and all those pretty pictures that you've seen um, in 22 West, that's all Jamel Shabazz. That's his eye. Thank you. He says, sure. And hey, Tracy. Tracy Lee just stepped in. How are you? So, that leads to me when you said Swiss Beats. Another fan says, how was it Swiss Beats chosen for the soundtrack? Well, there were a lot of people that were uh, that were trying to be part of this. And then we were courting um, everybody from Mike Will Made It to uh, DJ Mustard. And all these individuals, I love what they're doing, but they didn't have the sound. We needed a, a New York sound because it's a New York story. And I felt that Swiss, uh, myself and Nina Yang, Bon Jovi and Forrest and uh, Chris Roncado, we had this conversation. I just felt uh, Swiss was the way to do it, man. And I'm glad he did because when I was in the studio and I heard that track with Rick Ross and RIP DMX, I was like, wow, this is it right here. This is it, you know. And Swiss did a phenomenal job. Shout out to him, Grady, um, Mo. I mean, he painted the picture. He was the one that... The cleanup hitter that came and painted this uh the sound that you hear. Yes, ah, oh, I love it. God rest his soul, DMX. Um, I love everyone you had on that. Now with DMX passing, how is the crew handling that? Things to that nature. Oh, it, 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 it's very sad, man, and um. You know, DMX, on episode 201, uh, DMX uh, did a song for us. So you'll hear it on, on Sunday, the first episode. Um, I think it's on 201 that he did, but the, everybody's missing him, his energy, his vibe. I had just did a, um, a video for Just In Case with him up in Harlem. 
by um uh, the old Red Rooster. It was myself. It was DMX. It was Rick Ross. It was Forrest. It was Swiss. And he definitely had his energy is uncomparable to any any person that I know. You know, R.I.P. to him. Yeah. Um. I. I think I tried to reach out to his camp a month ago, and unfortunately, I I I've been a big fan from the time he stepped on the scene, and then when he brought Rough Riders and went to the concerts, Summer Jam concerts, and how you hear the growl first before he comes out. Oh, I just yeah. and his prayers. I just love DMX. <laughs> uh, DMX so, reminded me of a hip hop version of Jimi Hendrix from his pain and his stories and the things that he told. Um, great, great music, great sound. Um, it definitely was uh, uh, devastating. Yeah, it was. And the world felt that. We were still feeling it. And for you guys being closer than just the fans, our hearts go out to you guys as well. Yeah. Now, Margaret Johnson, did she give you pictures or photos that you could take to keep or does she have family loved ones that's still here yeah i'm here um, I, okay um but margaret johnson is there family members after her or is mm -hmm. she the last huh is Margaret Johnson, was she the last of the family bloodline or is there grandchildren um, you know out what? there? You know what? Margaret was Margaret was an individual that never mentioned anybody else. Margaret was very mysterious in her own way. I'm sure she has because, you know, I'm I'm her godson by default, right? Mm -hmm. So the story was really based on a screenplay that she had called Daddy's Little Girl. All right. Um Herself and Dame Dash were in business maybe for three or four years, and then that didn't work out, and she had a script that she was writing. You know, it wasn't based on um, the rap on the Harlem Godfather uh, that Mamie did. Margaret wanted to tell her story through the eyes of her. Margaret was really kind of like a loner. Like, she, she lived on Lennox Terrace. She had a, a dog, a poodle, uh, and her wheelchair. I don't know if you heard the story when she went downstairs and uh, someone tried to rob her, and she took out a three fifty seven and shot her. That type of individual. No, I didn't hear that. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> so the thing about, the beautiful thing about it that I liked was that Margaret got, to meet, Margaret got to meet everybody. She got to meet all the producers before she uh, passed away, and she gave, us, she gave us her blessings in so many ways, like, you know, from recordings to uh family pictures and things of that sort so it was a beautiful thing to be able to help her bring this to uh, fruition oh that is a beautiful thing and it's a beautiful thing that you still have these photos to pass on now being in and out of the um so are you looking for this is from one of our fans. Are you looking for independent artists for your soundtracks or theme music? If so, how can they send it to you? Um, well, the, the, that would have had to be done in the beginning of the season, and that would be going through Swiss because Swiss is the executive, uh, executive music producer. But the season is already wrapped, so right now we're not taking any type of submissions. But if you look on IMDb, there are two music supervisors, uh, Stephanie uh, diaz Mayos and Jordan, Jordan Carroll, you can uh, reach out to them. Okay. But right, now, right now, all 10 episodes are closed for music. Now, how do you look for the right actor or actress to be in the show? Um, It's basically, you know, we leave that up to... When, when casting comes back, you know, we make a, like a group decision and, and Chris Brancato really knows what he's looking for. You know, um, the person, the one person that I, I pushed for hard to get, and that was Nigel Thatch, who's playing Malcolm X. I could really say I was the one that was like trying to convince them to bring him in and he rocked the audition. And that's what you see right there in front of you. And he doesn't play Malcolm X. He works Malcolm X. That's what he's famously known for saying. 
He does. He does. Yeah. Now, what can we look forward to for this season? This season, you're going to be dealing with the French Connection and the drug operation, Malcolm X's, uh, Malcolm X's rift with the nation, and him leaving the nation, uh, Adam Clayton Powell. Uh, it's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of uh, crime. Uh, it's going to be a lot more action than last season, and the storyline is it, it, it's it's really dope how Chris and Paul put it together. Mm. I love the ending of last season when you made sure to show the brotherhood of when Malcolm was coming out, and yeah. then the nation tried to surround him. But then here comes his boy. Like, what's up? It's like, oh, you, he's not by himself. You haven't seen nothing yet. Like, this season, you're going to see more of that. Now, um, when I was going through, yes, I was going through your um, IG photos. One of them seemed to have Method Man in it. Can we talk Please. about that? You'll see the first season. Wait till Sunday. You only got two, <laughs> three more days. Okay, you'll see. But Method Man, he did a real Method Man did an amazing job for the character that he portrayed. You'll see Sunday when it comes on. I'm trying to get him on the show too. I'm okay. trying. I'm still pushing for him and Red Man because those are the dynamic duels in the rap industry. Now, how is it being that you've been around stars and things to that nature since Father MC, but now you're around you want to say big dog actors. How how does it make you feel when you first stepped on and you had Forrest Whitaker? You have all of the big heads in one room or to one stage. How does that feel? To be honest with you, um, myself and Forrest, we got a personal relationship where, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond Hollywood and Hollywood glamour. If you know anything about Forrest, he does not-for-profit he has conflict resolution stuff he's doing out in the Sudan with the child soldiers out in Mexico. So, you know, I never got starry-eyed because we started off as a relationship with just uh, a big brother talking to a little brother. You feel what I'm saying? So it wasn't like, oh, my God, I got all these other... It, when you're on set and you're working with people every day, they become friends. Because this is a character that you portray on TV. It's all make-believe. But at the end of the day, when it's the martini hour and it's rap, everybody goes back home and they become they become their individuals. Okay. Now, everybody says, I can't wait. Just rewatch the whole season over. I'm with you. I sure did, too. <laughs> now, what would you like to tell your fans and viewers? I tell people this, man. Know that I'm a walking testimony. Never give up on your dreams, man. If you dream it, you could definitely achieve it. A lot of people want success, but they're not ready to eat tuna fish sandwiches. They're not ready to eat ramen noodles. They're not ready to sleep on somebody's floor because they can't afford a hotel. They're not even ready to take a buddy pass knowing they got a meeting at Netflix on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, but they got to get out of JFK at, um, on Sunday. When you're willing to be able to do that, then success will be there for you. And... um. Just go out there, grab your dreams, because anything is possible. Amen. And what is, I forgot who was, said something about a book. They would like you to write a book. Oh, that's Big Shells. He's from, let me tell you something about Sheldon. Sheldon is my family, but my extended family. He was one of the individuals um, that um, when I was going through my hard time, his family had opened up their arms and let me stay with them for like about a year, year and a half. And we had great fun together. Um, great, great, great person. And um, yeah, he wants me to write a book about my life and be able to share my ups, my downs, and my lows, my highs with individuals. Uh, he says, my bro. It's a beautiful thing when you have a village. Yeah, definitely. The right village. Now Exactly. Now, if this is too personal, let us know. But a viewer asked um, asked me to ask you, with the situation with you and your mother, is she still alive? Have you reconciled from the time of her placing yeah. you out? Um, my mother is still alive and she's doing well. I love my mother to death. 
and the reconciliation. I mean, it's something that we work on every day. You know, I mean, it's it's not an it's not an overnight um, it's not an overnight thing, but it happens. You know, what I'm saying you, you got to mm -hmm. learn to live and forget, but not to forget, not to live, but ne never not to forget. You know, so yeah, you know, we're there. We we we're good. Good. I understand. My mother and I got into it when I was a teenager. Um, yeah. So I understand. She was like, okay, you know what? My rules, my house. I was like, well, whatever. She was like, well, then go with your grandmother or your father. I was like, bye. And I packed my stuff. And then she was like, come back home. Where are you? And I'm like, no. <laughs> but I learned it's not peachy at daddy's house either. <laughs> so yeah. No, I understand. I really do. But again, from your trials to tribulations, look at where God has you now. Nothing but flowers, King. We appreciate you bringing the story to the front, not Thank giving you. up, letting them know, yeah, I may be down, but I'm back up now. Thank you for having me. No, I appreciate it. Anyone else that's on, do you have any other questions while we have them on? But anything else you would like to leave your viewers? Because you know we're looking for Sunday. Check out Godfather Harlem Season 2, April 18th on Epics. And if you want to catch up on the first season, you can binge watch it now because it'll definitely be worth it. We put in a lot of hard work, and I'm sure you guys will be very excited and surprised to see it. I can't wait. Oh, Shay wants to know what's next. Oh, I have a bunch of uh, projects that I'm developing right now that I'm working with. Um, oh, I, it's, man, I have, a, I have a bunch of stuff that I'm working on right now. And when I'm able to talk about it, I will be letting everybody know. Oh, got to ask you one more before we go off the line. What are you doing to better the community? Or are you part of any fundraisers or things to that? Right now, I'm working with uh, working with juvenile offenders and showing them. You know, I do a lot of uh, 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 speeches and I, I work with kids, just letting them know, trying to give them some type of enthusiasm, letting them know from my testimony where I came from to where you don't have to go down that route. You know, I mean, I have a lot of friends that have been through the juvenile system from the Central Park Five, uh, Raymond Santana, and those guys. Those are all. You know, we all came up together. We've all seeing each other from different boroughs and different places, you know. And, you know, I'm trying to let individuals know that this is not your last hope, you know. Just strive, understand, and, you know, I'm trying to do the best that I can. I appreciate that, and I know they do, because some have no village. So that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, we thank you again. We thank you again. Now, is it okay to call you Silk or just keep All right. <laughs> thank you. Everybody bye -bye. says they're so proud of you. Thank you for all tuning in. Have thank a you. blessed night. And thank you. I wish nothing more but success for season two. And we will be watching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great night. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. bye. Seeing all these people... Hey, in the what up, what up, what up? What's going on, y'all? Live, baby. Live, baby. It's Hip Hop Friday. Hip, hip, hip Hop Friday. Oh. I have no other but Paris Smith from EPMT. Hip Hop can... Royalty. Uh, the Haymaker. Ladies and gentlemen. Ultra Corner is back, baby. What's back. going on, dog? Back like the first time. We good. good. Left you without a dope pod to step in. Come on, come on. It's your girl Sunshine here tonight. Tonight. This is exclusive. This is big. Tonight is about our fatigue. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Speak. Easy. Mm -hmm. DC, what's up? Come on, come on.